Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that you've joined us. Will you stand to your feet? We're going to sing about who God is, what he has done for us, and how we should live in response to that truth. So let's sing together this morning.
truths that we're singing. As we continue to sing this morning, I just want to invite us to really lean in to the truth that there is no one like our God. There's no one is worthy, no one that is holy, no one that has gone to the length that he has gone to have a relationship with us. I'm reminded in 1 Samuel that it says, there was no one holy like our God. Indeed, there is none beside him. So let's sing that together this morning and be reminded of how worthy and holy he is. Sing this out, worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. the name above every other name. 
Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Show me 
Heavenly Father, as we walk in this place, Lord, all of us walk in such different stories. But all of us walk into this place, Lord, needing to, needing to come to a place of reliance on you. All of us walk in here needing a greater dependence on you. So I pray, Lord, that what we just sang is true in our hearts this morning, that we trust you, that we long to build our lives on you. I pray, Lord, that this morning you reveal those areas of our lives we're holding back and you challenge us to walk in greater dependence on you. We love you, Heavenly Father. We thank you so much, Lord, that you allow us to come here freely and sing. That is a gift. It's truly a gift. I pray, Lord, this morning that you should continue to develop, help develop in us a greater dependence on you. Help us to see that need of you. And it's in your name I pray. And everyone said, amen. Thanks so much for singing with us this morning. If you're a guest visiting with us, we're so glad that you're here. If you're tuning in online, we're glad you're here as well. We want this to be a welcoming and warm place, especially in light of how cold it is outside today. Winter is here. So before you have a seat, would you turn to a couple people next to you, ask them their names, and then you can have a seat. Good job, everybody. I want to welcome you again to Pathway. My name is Brad. I'm one of the youth pastors around here. It's just so good to be with you, whether you're online or you're up in the venue or right here in the room. We're just grateful to be able to worship with you. And we're going to continue to do that over the next few moments. We just want to set aside some time to respond to God's love, his generosity that he's shown us through Jesus. And we're going to do that by entering into a time of giving. I believe that the choice to give to God and to his church is as much an act of worship as any song that we sing. And I know that on this very cold morning, there are probably a few extra people who are joining in with us online. It's, uh, it's a good thing that you can't see all the judgmental stares in the room right now, but uh, you know, we just feel, no, I'm kidding. But we want you to know wherever you are that you can give to. And we have a really simple way that you can give back to God out of a heart of worship today. We have a Pathway text number. It's going to be up on the screen. And you can just text the word give to that number, and it'll guide you through a simple and secure way that you can give to God today. And so wherever you are, we want to enter into that time of worship together. And I'd like to invite those who are serving us to come at this time. And as they come, would you join me? Let's pause and let's pray again. And let's give thanks to God this morning. Heavenly Father, we are thankful and grateful for you for the way that you give to us, for the grace that we have today, God, for your love and the forgiveness that we have through your son, Jesus. And so, Lord, as we take this moment as a church to give back, we pray that you would use what we give to do something incredible. God, we pray that you would work in and through us. And Jesus, just to catch a glimpse of your goodness and love today is enough. And so, God, thank you for that opportunity, and thank you for who you are to us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, as those buckets go through the aisles, I want to give a shout out to our connection communities real quick this morning. Uh, whether you know it or not, you sat in a community of people when you came in, and you know the color of your community by the cloth that's on the edge of the seat there. And uh, from time to time, we'd love to do a party for our connection communities. It's just an opportunity to get to know some people that you worship around every week. And next weekend, we have a Super Bowl carry-in for the red community. And so we want to invite you guys to stick around after the service next weekend. And if you're up for it, to bring some soup to share with those around you. We're going to have soup tasting judges and we're going to give some prizes. And it's going to be a really good time. So that we hope you'll, we hope you'll join us next weekend for that. Hey, this is a special weekend. We have some incredible things happening today. 
We're so passionate as a church about leading everybody that we can into a growing and vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. And yet we believe that the kind of growth that Jesus desires us to experience happens best in a small group. And we have group environments that meet all over Pathway. We have our small groups ministry. We have our men's and women's Bible studies, our marriage ministry, our young adult and college ministry, and lots of other places. And this morning, we get to celebrate with 287 individuals who are stepping forward to be small group leaders leaders in our church. And we're going to take a moment. And we got an applause for that. I like that. We're going to take a moment. and Two applauses. We got three. So you have to applause now. You're just, you can't not. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. We, we are so grateful for those that are stepping into these roles because they're so significant at our church. And so what we want to do is over the next few moments, we're going to pray for them. We're going to commission them as a church together. And in a moment, our senior pastor will come and he'll lead us through that. But before he does, our worship team is going to lead us in a song. And it's an opportunity for us to just spend some time as a church in prayer and in reflection. And our worship team chose this song because they believe and we believe that this is the prayer of our small group leaders. And we hope it's the prayer of our church. And so we want to invite you just to take some time with Jesus here over the next few moments as we get ready to commission and pray for our small group leaders. If the altar's where you meet us Take me there, take me there If you're looking for an offering It's right here, my life is here I'll be a living sacrifice for you. Your fire, the refiner. I wanna be consumed. I wanna be dry by fire. Purify. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be dry by fire. Purify. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. If your glory wants to come in, let it fall. We want it all. Lord, your fire is be a living sacrifice for you. You're a fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried by the fire. Purify, you take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my
as a sacrifice I want to buy for you Only for you You're a fire, the refiner I want to be consumed You're a fire, the refiner I want to be consumed I want to be tried by fire Yeah, that's good. <laughs> this is a this is an applauding service. That's a good thing, I think. But hey, those who are going to be prayed over, would you come down at this point and uh, just kind of stand right down here? You know, when the church got started back in Acts chapter two, it exploded in growth. Thousands came to know Christ, and God, in His brilliance, created this thing called the church. And as the church continued to grow, uh, so did ministries to small groups. It's almost as if God knew that it's one thing to sit in a row, it's another thing to sit in a circle. And people gathered together in people's homes, sat together around a table, they ate bread together, they broke bread together, they, they shared with one another, they shared concerns and needs, and the church met those needs and cared for one another deeply. And that's really what is happening here uh, in regards to all the folks that are standing before you, whether they're serving in adult ministry and youth ministry and college ministry and CR and re-engage and merge in our ministry towards couples who are married and girls getting married. It's all viable, important ministry that needs to take place. And so I want to pray for them this morning. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for uh, each individual that's standing here and for what they're willing to walk into, thinking about that song, Refiner's Fire, to, to refine me, Lord, um, many times we're refined when we put ourselves in a position of ministry to be, to be used by you and to be challenged and encouraged as well at the same time. And I pray that as they interact with the people that are going to be in their sphere of influence, that, Lord, you would give them uh, the ability to show grace and kindness, the ability at times to speak truth and love, more than anything, um, that they would create an environment wherever it be, whether it's upstairs uh, in a circle, sitting on the carpet in this building, or whether it's at their home in their living room, and that you would give them the ability to, to just be truly hospitable, and that is inviting those outside in uh, to be shown your love and your grace and to be taught your word. And they don't have all the answers, none of us do, and so in those moments, may they show humility. Other moments when they know what the truth is, may they just speak it boldly with confidence. And most of all, Lord, I pray that their homes would be a place where people are thriving and growing together in their relationship with Christ, with each other, and that those times that they're together would be full of joy as well. That when tears need to be shed, that they would all gather together and grieve with one another, support one another, and where there are moments of great celebration that we would see our small group ministry here at Pathway, various ages, be places of great celebration as well. So I thank you for their obedience. I thank you, Lord, for uh, how you're going to use them and how you are already using them. And we're grateful for their partnership in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let's affirm these guys one more time. Can we do that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if you're a guest with us this morning, we welcome you, and I can't believe you all showed up as cold as it is outside. I mean, I almost feel like I need to give you a hand, so I'll give you a hand. You don't have to give yourselves a hand. Anybody want to go start my car? Uh, just get it warmed up. That'd be great. Uh, we are in the second week of the series called God at Work, and we're really looking at how God interacts with us in our everyday particularly as it relates to our work. And so we're spending a few weeks talking about something that we all have in common as it relates to our work. And I think it's going to be, today's going to be uh, really meaningful to, to many of us in the space this morning. I hope it is, and I think the next few weeks will as well. But one thing we're trying to do is we're trying to engage with, with some everyday people, as we all are, 
in our everyday work, and uh, the one group we didn't want to leave out is that group that does such a great work every day, and that's the moms in this space that give so much time and attention to their kids who are at home, or those single dads as well, or those dads, stay-at-home dads that do the same thing. But this morning, take a look and just kind of see if you can resonate with some of the feelings that these ladies have experienced as it relates to, to their everyday work. Here it is. It's just hard sometimes to really see the value when you're drowning in what feels like just a lot of motherhood without acknowledgement, without feeling valued, without feeling a lot of the things that I had in the workplace. We had our first child and <clears throat> it was hard to leave him, um, but I kind of went part time. Then when we had our second child, it just got to be one of those things where it's like, man, this is hard to do both the work and home balance. And so ended up kind of against my kind of promise to myself, which was I can work as long as I want to, decided to stay at home. And how was it for you, Ezra? Well, um, I worked till our second child, KK. Yep. And then we have Gigi with his health and everything. And we kind of know, we realized that someone have to make a decision. I used to work at East Island. I uh, work with the Burmese community. So I do a lot of translation. So that is a job that, you know, I felt like I will stay. It's a mm -hmm. job that I can, something I like to do with kids and also with the community outreaching out the parents who don't speak, you know? You obviously really enjoy your kids, you're passionate about your kids, but it's different, it's more about them. How was that for you, Ezra? You know, when you work in that area, especially education, with your community, you're out there. You're like, you, you feel somebody, you enjoy it as a woman. As a mom, I'm feeling good about this decision, but then upon doing it, you kind of, lose yourself a little bit, um, or at least I did, where I had a, almost an identity crisis. Hey, you can do all these things and you get to go to work and you actually get a pat on the back. That was a shift for my pride, um, where it was like, is this all that I'm gonna do? I mean, that was really almost a saying and that sounds so arrogant, but is this all I'm good for, is staying home? And, and the hard thing was, it's what I wanted to do. So in that brokenness, in that hardness, it was, your relationship with Christ that kind of helped you. How did you feel like God was reaching out to you in those moments? Or did you feel like you had to be the one reaching out to him? I actually feel that he's reaching out to me more than me um, looking for him. Like every time I be still and I can hear that, you know, mm -hmm. just be still with me, I got this. Oftentimes that he sends people our way yes. in, in community and in connection to remind us of who he is, to remind us of who we are. You can't do it alone. And I was like, how did I do that? Like, mm -hmm. you know, expecting another one and having Gigi in a major surgery and two tablets, like another two kids in elementary. How that happened? Like, how did, like, he's there all the time. And he knew he made me that way, you know? Yeah. So for me, I think it's like, he made me to be this mom for my kid. This is my mission. Like, his mission for me is just to be a mom. If you are a mom, be the best you can be and yeah. thankful for what God gave you in that moment. Whether the role is is a CEO or whether the role is a mom or whether the role is a grandparent who's watching the grandchild or single person or college age like regardless um, we know that God says he's using all of us for the sake of his kingdom and that we can lean into that knowing that we all have a role to play in helping our world flourish and um, and so I think just faithfully saying, God, we are open to what you have for us and we will faithfully serve in that capacity to make others' lives around us better and more full. So let's thank those ladies for this morning. Let's do that. That's some baby here today. So as, as we walk into the series, there's one thing I wanted to bring your way, and that is what you saw at the end of that video is a little website, uh, Northeast, Indiana, Northeast Indiana Center for Faith and Works, and I think we've got it for you right here. Uh, maybe we don't. And uh, this actually came out of uh, what we've been doing as it developed as we talk about faith at work. And uh, matter of fact, Jeff is out in the uh, foyer area, and you can stop by his, his, uh, 
his area and just talk to him about various things that are happening as it relates to how we're helping people understand that God wants to interact with you within the context of your workplace as well. And then another resource I would really encourage you to consider picking up at some point is Tim Keller's book, Every Good Endeavor. Just a great work as it relates to really understanding God's place within your work as well. Now, why are we talking about work? Why is that so important? Well, last week I threw out that number to you, 90,000. And that is that if you live to be 72, you're gonna spend about 90,000 hours of your waking hours uh, working, and about a quarter of your life is gonna be spent at work. And uh, so as we talked about that, we talked about the reality that 53% of Americans just are really not happy with their job. They're unhappy with what they do. And which causes you to begin to ask some questions. Why am I doing this? And, and uh, what's the purpose of it? And why do I work? And so last week, uh, we looked in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God showing up uh, at the creation, showing us that God created each of us to work and that our work really does matter to God. And so when we looked into Genesis 1 and 2, there are four things we landed on last week. And that was that God introduces himself to the world through work, begins by working, that God designed us to work, that God divinely places us in our work to glorify him and to point others to him, that our work does have a sacred uh, connection to it, no matter what the work is, as long as it's a good work, and, uh, and that God loves his work. He, he loves you. And so one of the verses that, that we spent some time on last week, just a little bit of time, was Colossians 3, 23 and 24, that whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not as working for that boss that's frustrating you, or those other, uh, those other co-workers around you that are driving you crazy, but I can go into my job and I can say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to work at this as for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ that you're serving. In other words, keep Christ at the center of your work. Work in such a way, we'll talk about this next week, work in such a way that at the end of the day, no matter what, it, what the work is that you do, that at the end of the day, you could almost sense the pleasure of the Father, saying, well done today. Well done in the work that you accomplished. And the truth is, is that God created us, he created us to reflect his creativity and his presence through us in our everyday work. And so everything that God created, as we talked about last week, was good. At the end of everyday creation, he stepped back and he said, it is what? It is, it is good, it is good. And so it was all good. And then he created, he had that seventh day he rested and that was good because Rest allows us to, to recreate and to recreate once again and to live within the image of our creator. And then, then work, the work was good. So it was all good. And then comes Genesis chapter three. And in Genesis chapter three, we have the fall. And all things just fell apart. Uh, some, some would say, well, all things secular as well as all, all things sec sacred. But the truth is, is that all was sacred. Work was sacred, what man was doing was sacred, everything was sacred, but everything, everything fell apart, and, and the fall caused people to be broken, and so broken people broke relationships. You see that right off the get-go in Genesis 3. And then the fall caused work to be broken. And what we see here is we see that, that work becomes a curse, and it becomes a chore. And if you don't think that's, that's within us, that, that we don't think about work being a chore, uh, just ask your child to do a little work around the house. Uh, yeah, amen. I was, uh, one morning I was up, it's not been long ago, and uh, one of my kids was up getting ready for school. I won't say which one it was. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, the dishwasher was full and it was clean, and that's kind of her job. And so I said, hey, why don't you get up and empty the dishwasher? Oh, my goodness. It was like, you know, all lit up. And so, what are you talking about? She said, when, are you going to give me my allowance? I said, give you your allowance? I rescued you from an orphanage in China. <laughs> <laughs> allowance? I gave you a life, girl. What are you talking about? Now you really know who it is. So anyway, she got up and she unloaded. She's usually pretty good about that. But, uh, so anyway, we see this unfold in Genesis 3, 17 through 19. It says, to Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife, because Adam says, the wife you gave me made me do this. Okay, well, since you listened to your wife and you ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. This is where we see the curse show up. Through painful toil, do you see how work changes? Now through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life and it will produce thorns 
and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. And by the sweat of your brow, again, you sense that issue of work, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you, will, you are, and to dust you will return, he says. He said, there is, there's a curse that takes place here as it relates to this issue of, of, the, of the fall and as it relates to the issue of our work. And so, so the truth is that God didn't give work as a punishment, but the fall just simply makes work harder is what it does. And so the big idea for you this morning is this. It says, the fall caused people and work to be broken. And the promise is, is that Christ, Christ can redeem both is what it is. And so there's some realities of the fall and actually, Keller brings this out in his book. I'm just going to steal his four words and, and build from there. And the first is this, and that is that work becomes fruitless. It became fruitless is what it does. I have a little picture here. Back a number of years ago, we had a garden in our backyard, and, and uh, I decided to reduce it down to two boxes. And as you can see, I've had great success in growing what I've grown in, that, in those boxes. And, uh, and the truth is, I've never planted anything in those boxes, but you get these, these uh, thistles that grow and whatever else, and, and just, it's just a reality that it's going to take work in order for those boxes to flourish, in order for there to be, be some fruit that comes out of that labor. And, and the truth is, the same is true for all of us, that, that because of the fall, you have to put some work into your work, that you have to work the work of your education, or whether it be the, the work of sports, or, or relationships, or marriage, or parenting, or hobbies, or even your personal well-being. As you get fit, you try to get fit. It takes work and, and your work. Now, what does fruitless mean? Well, one writer put it so well that what you envision to be may not be. That, that you, you, because of the fall, your work is gonna include some pain and maybe some conflict and maybe some envy or a little fatigue or disappointment or frustration or deadlines or even unmet expectations. That not everyone's gonna get along at your work. You're going to have moments of, of, of unmet expectations. You thought it was going to be one way, it ends up being another way. I don't know if anybody's ever felt that way, but, but that's the result of the fall is what it is. I have a friend who uh, last year left his job. He, he was uh, involved in a business he really enjoyed and, and, uh, and a good hands-on deal, and it changed, the company changed hands. He thought, you know, I've been doing this a long time. I think I'm going to make a change. And his father, father-in-law owns a very large farm up in, around Bern. Uh, and he decided that he would um, take on farming, and so he left, his, left that part of it and jumped into farming. He's all excited about this. He kind of helps his father-in-law out, you know, as well, but he thought, man, I get to do this full-time, begin to take this thing on. I remember talking to him. He said, I cannot wait to get out in those fields. cannot wait to, to plant and, and uh, to do that. He just wanted to do the work of the farmer, till the ground and, 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 and re reap the harvest more or less, and, and if you remember right, last spring, the rains came, and they came, and they came, and they came, and they came, and, and soon the joy of what he was anticipating was replaced with the frustrations of what appeared to not be. And I remember talking to him on the phone and saying, man, here, here I walk away from my job, and I walk, and I'm doing nothing, <laughs> which was driving him crazy, and he felt fruitless in that moment. I'm not going to get to do what I really wanted to do, and and yet that is true in a lot of us, that sometimes our work can create a sense of fruitlessness. Last week I got a couple letters from some folks that have allowed me to share their letters. One comes from Melanie Gall. And, uh, and then just listen as I read this letter, and listen if you can resonate with a little bit of the fruitlessness in her letter. It says, I wanted to tell you how much I appreciated the message on Sunday. I have been a nurse in a cardiovascular ICU for over 15 years. Throughout the time, I have had the opportunity to see God's work both in and through me. And as a nurse, I've been able to see someone go home whom we thought would not live on this earth another day. I have also fought so hard to save a life, but then have, to have, but then have had to hold the hand of their loved one and help them say goodbye. As I grew as a nurse, I also grew in different roles that oftentimes took me away from the bedside of patients and seated at a desk with endless paperwork and deadlines, fruitlessness. While I still love my calling to be a nurse, I became a person I did not like, stressed, anxious, and physically ill, still trying to do my best because that is what my patients and staff deserved. And then she says, when I pursued higher education, my original goal was to use that degree and become an upper-level hospital director. God, God got a hold of me, and though not audibly, clearly said, I have different plans for you. I turned down a nurse management opportunity, accepted a position as a nursing professor. While I still worked as an ICU nurse part-time, I am also able to invest in the future of the nursing profession one student at a time. I again have joy and true passion for, for my work. 
I am so thankful for a God whose ways are higher than our ways and who knows the plans he has for us. So I say with confidence, God is at work all the time, many times in which we cannot see. Kind regards, Melanie. You feel the fruitlessness in it? And many of us, many of us have been there. The other way in which the fall affects our work is it begins to feel pointless. And your work becomes pointless when you begin to think that it's meaningless. Probably the best example I've got for you is, is King Solomon, who takes on the throne after David and, and builds a temple that David wanted to build that David couldn't build. And, and, and yet, towards the, towards the end, he begins to reflect on his life. He wrote this wonderful little book called Ecclesiastes. And, and in the book, he talks about how life, as he looks back at his life, there was just, it became fruitless and meaningless in what he was accomplishing. The first thing he says in Ecclesiastes 1, 12 through 18 is he talks about wisdom. That he pursued all this wisdom, but in pursuing all this wisdom, he looked back over all the wisdom and all the effort and all the time and energy he put into it, and, and he said it just seemed meaningless. And then he goes on, he talks about pleasure. They began to seek pleasure in, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. We see it and just look at how many times the word me or myself or my shows up. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives, and I undertook great projects, and, and I built houses for myself and planted vineyards, and I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them, and I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees, and I bought male and female slaves and other slaves who were born into my house, and I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me, and I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. And I acquired male and female singers and a harem, as, as well as the delight of a man's heart. And I became greater far than anyone else in Jerusalem before me. And in all this, my wisdom stayed with me. And I denied myself nothing my eyes desired or refused my heart no pleasure. And my heart took delight in all my labor. And this was the reward for all of my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the, way, after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Um, Tommy Nelson's written a wonderful little book called Life Well Lived. It's a book on Ecclesiastes reflecting on Solomon's life. and talks about how Solomon pursued pleasure as a lab rat, pursued wine, women, and song, and in the end, it found it all futile. He says, pleasure will make you mad and crazy because you have to deny the reality that life is filled with pain. A life based on pleasure doesn't have room for getting fired from a job, seeing a loved one waste away with cancer, or having a child die in a car accident. The only way to live for pleasure is to deny the reality of people hurting all around you with no ultimate meaning and purpose in life. It's madness. He said, recently, I shared Christ with the young man. He, married, he was married had a couple, a couple sons. He told me he has a group of drinking buddies. Most of them have destroyed their lives and everything good around them. They've lost their families through carousing, adultery, and the pursuit of pleasure. The young man told me they had recently asked him to go out, and he went with them to a bar where they cranked up the same old music, saw the same woman, women, and drank the same old drinks. And he just sat there thinking, I've got a wife. I've got great kids who need a good life and education. Finally, he got up and he left because he realized he had better things to do. The man walked out of the bar not because of his Christian morality, but because of Solomon's reasoning. He realized that his buddy's pursuit is vanity. It was madness and useless, meaningless. When your work becomes a means for gaining pleasure, eventually it's going to become meaningless. The third effect of the fall is that it affects our, our definition of achievement. Again, Solomon, verses 17 through 20 says, So I hated life. Because the work that is done under the sun, that is everything done down here on this earth, under the sun, if that's all that it is that I'm living for, go back to that slide, I'm sorry. Go back, go back, go back, go back. If that's all that I have to live for, then that's it. Is that really it? He said, all that, it was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun. He says, because I must leave them to the one who comes after me, and who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish, yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair 
over all my toilsome labor under the sun. I mean, Solomon is really giving us a little dose of reality here. He's saying the pursuits of this world will consume you. And he's saying one day your work will be done because you will be done. And someone else will step in and they're going to change everything that you worked so hard to accomplish. <laughs> you change it all. And I think what Solomon's telling us is whatever you do, don't forget, as James reminds us, that life is just a vapor. It's just a mist. It can be here today and it can be gone tomorrow. It can be here this morning. It can be gone this afternoon. You just don't know when. But in the end, what's feeding you matters. What's at the center of you matters. It's not the what, but it's the who because it's not your work that will save your soul. It's Christ. It's not your work that will give you, keep you give, directed towards an eternal perspective necessarily, but when Christ is in the center, it certainly can in that moment. So don't make your work the center of your life. Keep Christ in the center. Let things revolve around Christ. As Colossians 2, 6, and 7 says, as we were reminded the first weekend uh, of the year, so then just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, in him and him in you, in the center of everything that you do. Someone else sent me a letter this week, uh, Aaron Kreider, and, uh, Kreider, and I met Aaron last week. He was here at Pathway. After the service, I, I met him. He said, I want to send you a note. He said, I can resonate with what you said today in this series. And he was a mechanic on Indy cars. He talks about, in 2016, I finally achieved what I thought had, I had wanted over a decade of trying. I won the Indy 500 as the best mechanic, and in that moment, I was overjoyed and couldn't contain the amazement that I had finally done it. Long hours matched with an average of 27 plus weeks out of town for races and testing. It was who I was. It was my identity. It was all that mattered. I had no time for anything else at all. Now I had finally become the embodiment of what my career told me I should be. Two hours later, I felt empty and unfulfilled. The realization that I had neglected everything around me to the point of it being nearly too late weighed heavily on me. My wife had divorced me four years earlier. Still wasn't enough for me to realize I needed to reprioritize. My children barely knew me more than a passing acquaintance, and I had no friends outside of my teammates. I was far from faith. I had to leave my career and find a way to make things better. Looking back at the following years after I quit, I can see God was putting appointment opportunities in front of me to get back to where he wanted me. I was still so hung up on my racing career that, and that win in May as my identity that I was disgruntled and either ignored or sabotaged everything that he was offering me. Three years later, a close friend whose opinion I value greatly was encouraging me to go to church and find my way to fixing all that was wrong in my life. I fought it and fought it for some reason. I couldn't even tell you why. I eventually found my way back to Christ. I'm now realizing that by giving my identity to him instead of trying to find the, that validation from work, things are starting to fall into place. This is still early in my journey back to where he wants me, but the differences are astonishingly apparent, astonishingly apparent from where I was and where I am now through prayer, fellowship, spending time in his word, and can be contributed to nothing else but Christ. It's a great, great letter. Work also became selfish. That is Solomon, it was all about himself. Pride, lust, envy, gluttony, anger, laziness. Someone's put it so well that without something bigger than yourself to work for, then all of your work energy is actually fueled by one of the other six deadly sins. You may work exceptionally hard because of envy to get ahead of somebody or because of pride to prove yourself or because of greed or even gluttony for pleasure. And so... Well, this does not mean that our desires are necessarily wrong in themselves. They do become wrong when they are not aligned in with a proper perspective of what your work can really be about. I was listening to someone talk one day about this issue of work and their faith, and they were talking about a, a time in their life when they took a job at Starbucks. And um, I like going to Starbucks. I go to the same Starbucks all the time. I, they, now know, they now know my name. I walk in, hey, Ron. They now know what I want. You want a tall, dark roast? Yeah. One day I walked in and, and hey, Ron. And then somebody came out of the back room and says, hey, Ron. And then he stops and says, I don't know who you are, but since they know who you are, I decided I would just call you by name too. He said, well, thank you so much for doing that. And so anyway, this individual was talking about a time when he was working there and, and, uh, and he said they had a customer that came in and ordered the same drink all the time and wanted it a certain way. And so 
he got his drink and he, he, uh, he took a drink of it and he didn't like how it was mixed. He took the lid off and he threw it towards the barista. And he said, this individual said, I came unglued. He said, I just let this guy have a piece of my mind, told him to leave the restaurant, never come back again. He said, I was so frustrated. And then it wasn't long before their, their divisional manager was in there, and, and he was still trying to figure out, you know, what's the point of what I'm doing, and, and what is this all about? And, and they had their team time together, and before she left the, that particular Starbucks, she kind of stopped for a moment, kind of put all of her stuff in her little case and stopped for a moment. She just kind of looked at them, and they knew it was kind of a moment. And she said, I I guess what I'm trying to get across to you today is that we don't serve coffee to customers. That's not why we're here. We serve customers coffee. And he said that totally changed everything for him. Because he realized he's here to serve those who come into this place. And I think sometimes maybe our work can take on a different perspective when we begin to, to understand that, that maybe what I need to do is I need to move from being selfish to being selfless. Maybe, maybe in those moments where I'm feeling like it's all about me and I'm frustrated with that situation or with those around me, that maybe what I need to do is just step back, just a thought here for you, and look in Philippians chapter 2 and see how Christ humbled himself and took on the form of a, anybody can finish it, on the form of a servant to serve you and me, to humbly go to that cross, to be that atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then work also, because of the fall, it reveals our idols. As a result of the fall, instead of using our work to co-labor with God, our work becomes our God. And your work is just as sacred as my work. All of our work is sacred, believe it or not. We can, we can bring the glory of God into, into what we're doing as long as it's good work. Idols, and idols are basically good things that become our chief obsession outside of God. One author put it so well, that a good thing can become a bad thing when it becomes the ultimate thing, when anything or anyone becomes more important than God, even if it's a good thing, it's an idol. There, there are times, and I'll just tell you, I haven't told any other any of the other services this, but there, there are times for me, there have been times when this has become my idol. When I am so engrossed in the work of God that I realize I'm missing the work that God wants to do in me. And it becomes all-consuming. And it not a good thing. And we all we all can be prone towards that. And so what's the remedy? We're going to speak a little bit more about this next week, but let me just give you two things to think about. One is redeem your work. First is just redeem your work. Don't, don't make work your identity, but find your identity in Christ first. And let your, let your work flow out of that identity. Ephesians 2.10 uh, Paul again says to us, for we are God's handiwork, you are God's masterpiece, you, you are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so one way, let me just kind of throw this out to you and you just think about it this week, uh, one way that we can redeem our work is by embracing our work, as we talked about last week, as our calling, as a platform that God has placed you on and using your gifts, your talents, your abilities, your influences and your skill sets to do the work that only you can do and to receive that as a calling. A number of years ago, there was a Super Bowl commercial that talked about Ram trucks and, and Paul Harvey uh, narrated the commercial and it, it talked about this issue of calling. And I think it puts all things in perspective. Take a look at what it says. And on the eighth day, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, milk cows, work all day in the fields, milk cows again, eat supper, then go to town and stay past midnight at a meeting of the school board. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody willing to sit up all night with a newborn colt and watch it die and dry his eyes and say, maybe next year. I need somebody who can shape an axe handle from a persimmon sprout, shoe a horse with a hunk of car tire, who can make harness out of hay, wire feed sacks, and shoe scraps. 
who planting time and harvest season will finish his 40-hour week by Tuesday noon and then pain in from tractor back, put in another 72 hours. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody strong enough to clear trees and heave bales, yet gentle enough to yean lambs and wean pigs and tend the pink-combed pullets who will stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadow lark. So God made a farmer. It had to be somebody who'd plow deep and straight and not cut corners. Somebody to seed, weed, feed, breed, and rake, and disc, and plow, and plant, and tie the fleece, and strain the milk. Somebody who'd bail a family together with the soft, strong bonds of sharing. Who would laugh, and then sigh, and then reply with smiling eyes when his son says that he wants to spend his life doing what dad does. So God made a farmer. When I finished watching that, I went out and bought a ram truck. <laughs> I didn't. I can't do that. Put yourself in that spot. Instead of the farmer, put what you do in that spot. See, the other way we redeem our work is by resting and reflecting on the truth that God has given you a work to do. The fall ushered in brokenness which means brokenness is present in your work. You might work in an office that feels like the office. <laughs> you might be frustrated by what isn't and what you see could be. We'll talk about that next week. You might be wondering what redeeming value your work has. All of your work can have redeeming value. The last I would tell you is this, that Maybe what you need to do is, if you've never done this, just embrace your Redeemer. Because the fall not only affected our work, it affected our soul. Death now entered, physical death as well as spiritual death. There was now separation between man and, and his creator. And that the remedy for that was God sending his son, Jesus, to go to that cross, as we see in the New Testament, to be that atoning sacrifice for our sins. The wages of sin is death. It causes a lot of death, a lot of destruction. Relational death, spiritual death. But God offers a gift that's eternal, far outweighs this world. It's not about what's under the sun. It's about what goes beyond in our life eternal with God through Christ Jesus, our Savior, and that he offers that because of the work that he did for us upon that cross. I don't know if you've ever done that before. If you ever come to the place of acknowledging the fact that Jesus Christ is your Savior, maybe you've never done that before. And you realize there's an emptiness in your life, kind of like what Aaron was speaking to. And that emptiness is because there is a God-shaped vacuum in your life that only God can fill. And the simplest way to resolve that is to redeem it by saying, Lord Jesus Christ, redeem me today. Redeem me today. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the practicality of your word. It amazes me that we can get into the word of God and we can look at it and we can see how it applies to our everyday life that even at times when we do read it, we don't get it, but there are other times when we see how it, it penetrates to the very depth of the marrow of our bones to, to reveal something new to us, to challenge us, to change us, to transform us, and, and Lord, to reveal even a greater plan that you have for us. And I think that plan does impact what we do every day, whatever that work is, whether we're a student, whether we're a teacher, whether we're a homemaker, whether we're a doctor or engineer or mechanic or we sweep the floors or we cook the food or we serve the food or we manage the food or it doesn't matter, whatever it is. That God, you long to be in that work and you long to be in our lives. And that's why you demonstrated to us the depth of your love to us upon that cross some 2,000 years ago. There may be someone in this space down here, online, upstairs, that they've never come to the place of surrendering their life over to you. There's no magic prayer. But maybe in the quietness of this moment, they would just simply say, Lord Jesus, 
you are not the center of my life. And I need you at the center. And I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and he's a savior. And I thank you for that work that you did for me upon that cross and for the forgiveness that you offer to me. And I thank you for that. And I receive that. And I ask that you would become my savior, my leader, and my guide from this day forward. Lord, your word tells us that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just, will forgive us, that, that God, you, you enter into our lives. And if someone prayed that prayer in a simple way this morning, you've heard that prayer, you're faithful to it. I pray you'd give them the courage to take the next steps and digging deeper into this community, growing in their faith in Christ, allowing others to come around them and to help them grow as well. I pray that they would, they would sense their life is fruitful as a result of the work that you're doing in them and through them. Guide us as a church to be that church in our community that saturates our neighborhoods and our homes and our workplaces with the gospel by the way in which we live in each area of our life. We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you need prayer this morning, some folks down front love to pray with you. If you're a guest, stop by guest services. If you're um, looking for next steps, stop by next steps. Go warm up your cars. See you later. Have a great week, everybody.